Almighty God, we give you thanks for your presence this morning. We know that you are here, for you have said, where two or more are gathered, there you shall be also. As we've come in through the rain, we're reminded of how the rain renews the earth, cleans away those things that need to be gone, and brings new life as we find ourselves in the first week of spring. Flowers come forth, 
plants bloom and the cycle of life begins again. Oh God, may your Holy Spirit so move in this place this morning that you would open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear, and our hearts that we may truly know and understand all you have to say to us in this place on this beautiful morning. For we offer ourselves in worship in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith with the historic confession, the Apostles' Creed, which can be found printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have children with you this morning, I hope you'll let them come spend a few minutes with me. Good morning, friends. That's pretty good. Good morning for a rainy Sunday morning. So I mentioned in my prayer this morning, this, this, a few days ago was the first day of spring. Did everybody know that? Yeah. Yesterday was a beautiful day. Now, I know for some of you, who had opening day at baseball yesterday? We had some opening day baseball players yesterday. I saw some pictures floating around about that. Who got outside yesterday and enjoyed the beautiful weather? I did. What did everybody do yesterday in the outside? My family rode our bikes. What did you you do? Your scooters? Had a baseball game? Had a baseball game? So everybody got outside and enjoyed the beautiful weather. If you paid real close of attention, yeah, you were playing with Gavin outside, and so, so you had a friend to play with outside. We all had a good time. If you look closely, a, a, few, a couple of three weeks ago, we started seeing daffodils pop up through the ground, and that's the first signal that spring is coming. But then if I look closely in my yard, some of the trees are starting to get some, the green is wanting to pop out, and our camellias are blooming. It's all proof that, that, that spring is here, and all these plants that have been kind of quiet and sleeping during the winter are going to come back to life in all their beauty and, and all their glory, and spring sports Baseball and soccer and softball will all start up and we will all be outside and enjoying God's creation. There's also something that comes with the spring, it's pollen, and I think the preacher got a dose of that this week. So, um, so we, spring comes, brings a lot of good things and, and we have to take the pollen to get that good stuff. Will y'all bow your heads and y'all pray with me this morning? Y'all repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the beauty of spring. Help us to pay attention and see the glory of your creation. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all can either return to see your parents or head out to Turtle Church.
service audible. Um, there are two, alas, and did my Savior bleeds. There's 294, but Ariel determined that 359 would be the, the tune with which we would be more familiar. So we are singing, alas, and did my Savior bleed, but we're going to do so to 359. So we'll give you a second to find that. And then as you do, will you stand with me as we sing together hymn 359, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. We come to our time of prayer this morning. I always invite you to see our prayer list that can be located on the back of your bulletin. And also would ask if there are any celebrations of concerns you'd like to share with us this morning that you find a prayer request card that 
Hopefully you can find located in the pew back in front of you and place that out. Fill that out, place it in an offering plate, and then fail to ask you if you've not yet done so to, uh, to uh, register your attendance this morning. And I got so excited uh, at, at register, or during the beginning, I failed to ask everybody to check in. So now is as good a time as any to take out your cell phones, your smartphones, find Facebook, find Atlanta First United Methodist Church. Our Facebook page has a beautiful, colorful picture of the church as its, um, as its profile picture, and I invite you to go and check in and let your friends and family know that you're here and that you're having a good time. And, if they, and we had a few people actually share quotes last week, and so if there's anything quote-worthy or newsworthy or noteworthy, then I invite you to share that via social media as well this morning. And, and if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, you can register your attendance and tear that off and place it in an offering plate as well. Will you join with me now as we go to God in prayer? Almighty God, we do give thanks for this, the beginning of spring. Although winter might get one last shot with a little cold rain, we know that beautiful blue skies and Gorgeous blooms are just around the corner. We're so fortunate in Georgia that we get these seasons and we are reminded that these seasons echo the seasons of life. We're reminded of the times in our life when when we see you clearly and vividly. We're reminded of those times in our life where everything seems to be dark and bleak, yet you are still there. Oh God, we thank you for the time to gather. We're grateful for this church and this country in which we're free to come and worship as we choose, to share and express our faith freely and openly. We certainly pray for those who put themselves in harm's way, defending that right. And we pray for all those who have come home. We pray that you might that they might know your presence, know your peace as they struggle to re-enter society and leave behind the difficulties of war. Oh God, as we find ourselves in the middle of Lent, we continue to march toward the cross. As Christians, we know on the other side of the cross is the resurrection, but we, we during Lent try to faithfully remember and recognize the incredible sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Oh God, in addition to our prayers this morning, we come bearing our gifts and we offer to you your tithes and our offerings. We know that you created us and all that is around us, thus all that we are and all that we have is a gift from you. So God, we come We bring these gifts and we ask that you would bless them and multiply them and that you would give us wisdom to be good stewards of these gifts, that we might use the gifts to make a difference for others, not for our sake, but for yours. So, O God, accept these our prayers and accept these our gifts, for we offer them in the name of Christ our Lord who taught us when we gather we should pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
if you walked into the room if you stilled the crowd if your light dispelled the gloom and if I saw your wounds touch your thorns Wonder if I know you now. Would I know you now if you walked into this place? Would I cause you shame? Would my games be? so much, Ariel. Think about what Ariel just sang as we hear our gospel lesson proclaimed this morning, which comes from John's gospel, the 12th chapter, beginning in the 20th verse, John 12, beginning in verse 20, and out of respect for the reading and hearing of God's word, I invite you to stand as you're able. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks, and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and this is how Jesus answered them. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it eternally. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. We be seated. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Think with me for a few minutes this morning as we continue our going viral series. Think with me this morning. Would they, will they see Jesus? Would they, will they, will we see Jesus? It's a very familiar text in John's gospel when the Greeks come seeking Jesus. They come to Philip and Andrew. We wonder why Philip and Andrew, and and the fact was is that Philip and Andrew had Greek names, and so maybe these Greeks who came seeking Jesus thought that would be the best place to start. But there's this simple, simple phrase, sir, we wish to see Jesus. In other translations, it just says, we would see Jesus. Now, for those of you who weren't here last week, we're in our series called Going Viral. And last week, we we found ourselves at the end of Matthew's gospel, and we, we read again Jesus giving the great commission, which was to go into the world to make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That we would go into all the world to share the gospel message. And I I reminded us that, that we don't need a special mission statement because Jesus in the Great Commission gave us our mission and our mission is to go throughout the world making disciples. And we talked a little bit about this phenomenon of going viral, things that go viral when each day and each week brings with it something new that goes viral. I was careful last week because it had just gone viral, but it, it has taken on a life of its own this week. And just to, to, uh, to um, calm any fears, um, the Finance Committee and the Staff Parish Relations Committee met this week, and, and we have taken the order for my jet off the table for right now. (laughs) See, the laughs tell me that everybody in this place knows what I'm speaking of. That took on a life of its own. Again, I I must be careful in this. It's a a fellow pastor, and, and it's not for me to judge, but I can report the facts, which are many people were very turned off by that. And we could spend a whole sermon talking about that. But you remember last week the quote that I shared and seemed to resonate with some. And that was, you do the best what you do the most, so be careful what you do because it might go viral. The church must be careful what goes viral, what goes forth from us. Because the fact of the matter is that just like the Greeks, the world today is seeking Jesus. And, and let me tell you something, church. The fact of the matter is there's a whole group of people who are seeking to discredit the church. And they don't have to go far when a story goes viral like the one that did this week. What's interesting about our text this morning is it's never clear whether or not the Greeks ever get to see Jesus. They come, to, they come to Philip and they come to Andrew and Philip and Andrew go to tell Jesus that the Greeks are there to see him and Jesus just jumps into his discourse. He jumps right into this message and, and we'll recall in the Gospels, throughout the Gospels, Jesus will say something like, my hour has not yet Come, but in today's lesson, Jesus says, The hour has come 
for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then this quick line, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain, but if it dies, then life continues to flourish. I had to look up how wheat grows to make sure I understood this. Obviously, Jesus is speaking to an agrarian society, one that would understand very well. And in fact, I learned that, that wheat itself has its origins in the same part of the world in which Jesus was ministering. They knew all too well exactly the life cycle of wheat. And if you look up how wheat grows, what you find is it goes through this entire cycle. And just as, you would, as the wheat gets to its tallest point is when it begins to wither and die so that the, the head can, can dry up and those seeds can once again fall to the ground. So from one wheat seed comes a wheat stalk that produces a head that produces many more seeds. And in, in that way, wheat itself is somewhat viral and that wheat can be produced over and over and over again. But Jesus reminds us that, that for some things, we have to have death before we can have life. Often for us, it is death to ourselves and our selfishness and our self-centeredness. It's hard to do because the world, from the time we're little, tells us it's all about us. And then we start trying to tell our children, it's really not all about you. It's a vicious, vicious cycle. Why do we think the Greeks wanted to come and see Jesus? If we look in John's gospel, I think there are some clues. And the first clue goes back to the, to the second chapter. In the second chapter of John's gospel, Jesus has gone with his mother to a wedding. And it appears for all accounts that Jesus really was just going to enjoy the wedding. He was just going to be Jesus at the wedding. Just wanted to kind of hang out. But then they began to run out of wine. And Jesus' mother, seeking to kind of push him into the spotlight, gathers the servants and tells them to do whatever Jesus tells them. Now, I have to take a quick time out here, and I think I've shared this before, but I can't allude to this text without telling this story. The story is that when I was seeking ordination, uh, that we, we have to preach a sermon, um, and that sermon is, is recorded, and then it's provided to the Board of Ordained Ministry for all to review. And this was the text that I preached for ordination. And I had titled my sermon, Do Whatever He Tells You. And I was quite proud of it. It was well received in my congregation at the time. Uh, Shannon had, had transcribed it for me and many of my normal kind of speech patterns. I had managed to avoid those, those ticks that can kind of show up in my speaking. It was, I felt an excellent product. It was shortly after or around the time that, that Zach had been born. And, and so, uh, and I say all of this, that we had a group of candidates over the past few weeks to go before the Board of Ordained Ministry for, for ordination is in, in full connection. And I, from understanding, most everyone passed with flying colors. So we get into the room and, and, and the, the um, head of ministerial services at the time even mentioned, uh, we have one person in here who, who has had a special week and that their son has been born. I thought, oh, they're going to feel sorry for me. I've, I've been up, you know, all night, all night, and, and I've got a new son, and so I'm in good shape. And then Walter Kimbrough gets up to offer the devotion. How many of you know who Walter Kimbrough is? So if you know Walter Kimbrough, Walter Kimbrough has this big, booming voice and can preach him can, uh, preach like nothing you've ever heard. And he gets up to preach. Do you know what text he preaches from? The wedding feast at Cana of Galilee. And he stands up there and he says, their wine had run out. And I thought, Lord, I'm in trouble. 
He goes on to preach a sermon about when he first went to that appointment where it had always had white preachers and they had locked the door to his office and not allowed him to have a key. He had to break into his own office the first Sunday at that church. And one little girl, one little white girl walking down the hall saying that that was going to be her family's last Sunday at that church because he was going to be their new pastor. Let me ask you a question. If someone who had entered that church that morning seeking Jesus, would they have seen Jesus in that place? I certainly was praying to Jesus after he got up and preached like he did from that text, knowing that I was going to go have to defend my do whatever he tells you sermon. The Greeks came seeking Jesus because at a wedding feast of Cana of Galilee, I don't know if you've ever paid attention to this window in the front, and you probably can't see it exactly from where you're seated. But if you look at this picture, it is the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. And if you look carefully, the steward, the wine steward is pouring, and the upper portion of what is pouring is water, but the lower, lower portion as it makes its way into the vessel is wine. You know, before we had the internet and social media for things to go viral, this is how the church told its story. Jesus is blessing the water and it's turning into wine. And because people had seen that and heard that and shared that story, the Greeks came to Philip and Andrew and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. And because they saw that later along the road in Jesus' ministry, as we get into chapter 4, Jesus was again in Cana of Galilee, and, and, and an official came to Jesus, and he said, um, Sir, please come down before my little boy dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed Jesus and he went back home and as he did, he heard a miraculous story of how his son had recovered and the, the man asked when his son had begun to recover and they told him and he realized that it was the very moment when Jesus had said, go, your son will live. And so that story began to spread and the people wanted to know who this man Jesus was. Later in chapter 9, there was a man who had been born blind and, and he came to Jesus. And Jesus healed his blindness. And then the man has to go on defending himself and his family has to defend themselves. Because by now, the religious leaders are becoming agitated and aggravated because what is happening is, well before the internet, well before social media was allowed stories like this to go viral, the fact that Jesus had turned water into wine and had healed a, a, an official's little boy and now has healed a blind man, this story is beginning to spread from town to town, from village to village, from family to family People are saying, have you heard what this man, Jesus, is doing? Have you heard what is going on? Just before our story from this morning is, is really the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And that straw that broke the camel's back was when Jesus was called upon following the death of Lazarus. And Jesus raises this man from the dead. You see, up until this point, you could kind of explain away what had happened, right? Oh, there was some trick involved. They, they switched out the, the vessels and... It was really wine all along, and the little boy had a fever. The fever broke. What's the big deal? And we're not even really sure this man was blind, but everyone had seen 
the man die. And there were groups who were there watching as he was brought back to life. And the government officials knew that this kind of person could not be tolerated. If this story was to continue to go viral, their power would be at risk. But the question remains for us this morning, in the midst of all of this, that these people came seeking Jesus. They came, they wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to know who this man was. These Greeks represent the world. And the world is coming to our doorsteps and they're knocking and they're asking and they're saying, we would like to see Jesus. The reason that you're here this morning in some way, shape, or form is that you've come to this place seeking something different than what the world offers. Here's the challenge. And it's the human condition, and we aren't to beat ourselves up for it, but the challenge is we're the same human beings inside this place that we are outside this place. And the question we have to ask ourselves this morning is that when people come to this place seeking Jesus, will they see him? Because the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to be like Jesus so that Jesus can be seen as he meant himself to be? Are we willing to be like Jesus so that people can see Jesus as Jesus meant for himself to be seen? Now, I'm not sure any of us are going to suddenly have the ability to turn water into wine. If we could do that, we could probably pay for all the repairs we need to make to this building quickly and then help all the other churches in Atlanta do the same. I'm not sure we're going to do that. We certainly have all prayed for people to be healed and, and, and we stand around and, and, and pray and we, we hope and we are the presence of God for families who are in the midst of difficult circumstances. And although maybe we've not seen life absolutely snatched from death, we have certainly seen lives recovered One of the most special moments, there are so many special moments throughout the week at Atlanta First, but one of the special moments is occasionally we hear a celebration on Mondays or Wednesdays coming from the fellowship hall or from the currents classroom. And that is our, our, that is our, uh, that is our NA group. And anytime ha- anyone has a celebration, a multi-year celebration of being clean and sober, They bring in a cake and they celebrate. And what we know is that that was a life that was once lost and that somehow, some way, through the power of prayer and and a higher being and the fellowship of others who know that journey, that person has been brought from death to life. And on an annual basis, they celebrate that new life. The Greeks came seeking Jesus. As a church, when people come, we want to be Jesus, and how do we do that? The first way that we can be Jesus is by welcoming all who come our way. In other parts of John's gospel, Jesus comes across people who society had cast out. The woman at the well was among them. Others who were considered unworthy to be part of community. But they were all welcomed. And so our first step as a church to being like Jesus so that people who come might see Jesus is that we make it clear that this is a place where all are welcome. And before we 
get caught up in arguing about how one might celebrate Jesus. Jesus was pretty clear that there were many ways to worship God and and, and certainly as the church begins to grow, it was clear that there were many manifestations of worship. And so we have to be a church that welcomes all and we have to be a church that makes sure that all feel welcome. We welcome all and we make them all feel welcome. And then if we're going to be like Jesus so that people can see Jesus as Jesus meant for himself to be seen, our primary focus has to be not on ourself, but on others. Because it is clear in our gospel from this morning that we must die to ourselves to live in Christ. We must die to our own selfish ambitions. We must die to what we think the world should be, the church should be, and allow it to be what Jesus needs it to be. And here's what I know. The moment that we can do that is the moment that the message of Christ goes viral. And the moment a church is able to do that is when it is able to go viral in its community. Because people will come to our doors knowing that when they arrive, just as the Greeks had sought to see Jesus, they know that they will see Jesus. I've shared it with you before, but it's worth repeating. My, my dear friend David Bowen called it skin on Jesus. If we can become skin on Jesus, when people look at us, they see us, but if they look deeper, if they search harder, if we allow ourselves, then they might just see Jesus and the world might come to know him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
closing hymn is hymn number 361, Rock of Ages, Clef for Me. Will you stand with me as we sing the first and the last verses? grateful to have friends and family with me and some of my dearest friends in the world are here this morning, Ron and Karen Greer, and grateful for their presence. And um, if you don't know of both of them, they're awesome people. And Ron has written a book called Markings on a Windowsill. And if you ever find yourself or someone you love in a moment of grief, then this is a perfect little book to buy and to share so that they might uh, take that journey of grief with someone who's been there and can share with them wonderful ways to get through. So we're so grateful to have you here this morning. I, 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 I leave us with this message this morning after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. The leadership gather and they say, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Wouldn't it be wonderful if someone was saying of Atlanta First United Methodist Church, if we let them go on like this, everyone will believe in him. May it be so. Go forth in peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's family said. You find-